you have a Bible with you, you can turn over to the epistle to the Philippians. And if you don't know where that is, it's right after the Ephesians. Right before Colossians. We're going to read a couple of passages real quickly. Actually, we'll just read one, and then I'm going to pray. In Philippians chapter 2, we'll go to verse number 1. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation, that word could be encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus today that we, your people, would be like-minded. And Lord, we know that that like-mindedness has to start between us and you, and then it works between us together. And we thank you, Father, for that. Let this message minister to our hearts, Lord, that we, whether we're laying out the net as a group or whether we're doing individual things, that we can have the like mind, that we can have one spirit, one accord. And we thank you for that, Father, and we praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was looking through this passage. In fact, I'm actually been doing a series in Philippians that you couldn't tell because it's been so long since we spoke, but you may remember I, I preached not, uh, in, in recent history anyway, <laughs> grace-minded, being grace-minded, and uh, about how we have to extend grace to people, even as God has extended grace to us, and we have to have the mind of Christ on that because it's not always easy to give grace over and over and over and over to people who, you know, don't seem to get it and keep doing things that we have to forgive and all that. But uh, well, we have to keep extending that grace. Well, the, today's message is being like-minded, being like-minded. Let me say that being like-minded doesn't mean that we think exactly alike and we become a cult and you have to follow this and that and you think the same way that I do. That's not what like-mindedness is. Like-mindedness is an ability to be able to work in one accord, in one heart, in one mind together. Not that we don't have differing opinions about things, but it's that we seek the will of God together so that we can accomplish the will of God together. Amen? And when, when we read this little passage here, we notice it starts out with a therefore, and a therefore means that there's something else in front of it. And in order to save some time, I'm only going to read verse 27 instead of the whole thing. Only let your conduct, this is chapter 1, be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs. And that's not your infidelities and the things that you've done that you should be ashamed of, but the uh, work that they were doing together and laboring, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. My first thought this morning as we think about being like-minded, the first thought is, is that we have to, number one, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Now, I say this, this sounds like a funny thing to start out with on being like-minded, but the fact is, if we aren't one heart and one mind with the Lord, and you can't be if your conduct is not worthy of the gospel, then we're not going to be one heart and one mind together. If we don't have, if we're not of the same spirit of consolation, the same spirit of fellowship, as it says there in chapter 2, if we don't have that same connection with God, uh, if, we don't, if we're not connected to him, we're not really going to connect together. And I think that's one of the issues that happens in a lot of churches is that their relationship with the Lord is suffering, and that relationship with him, if that's not right, then your other relationships will suffer as well. Everybody wants a marriage made in heaven, but if you don't have a connection with heaven, you aren't going to have that, amen? If your relationship with God isn't strong, you're not going to stand when adversity comes and when things happen. You've got to have that relationship with him first. Your conduct, the way that you live, the way that you behave, the things that you do or don't do have to line up with the gospel, with the good news. We live the good news. We are the light in this world. We're the people who represent him here. 
when his, when his light shines, it's supposed to be reflected off of us. Amen? Now, we dig up all of our seed if we don't act right. Uh, I remember hearing a song one time, and the lyrics really struck me. And it was, a, it was more of a, a contemporary Christian song as opposed to a, a worship song. But it said, you, uh, you're, you're con- it said basically, your actions are so loud that I can't hear what you're saying. And sometimes our actions aren't Christian enough. We have other actions, whether we're getting upset and mad and have to have our own way, which kind of is what's leading into our whole idea about being like-minded. We're supposed to be together, and it says in verse 27 in one, it says, stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One spirit, one mind. And verse number uh, Two in the other chapter says, Fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. We got to be on the same page. Now, I don't read languages other than English. I know, I don't read Kentuckian, I don't read any of those other languages. I've been working on my, my Australian jokes because I found out that people from New Zealand tell Australian jokes. And uh, so I've been reading my, uh, my, uh, my, basically it's the New Zealand joke book, which is all about Australian people. So it's kind of like we would do for those people from the south, if you know what I mean. People from Shelley land. And uh, way down south in the land of Shelley. My feet stink, but hers are smelly. Look away, look away, look away. Anyway. I don't, I don't speak other, I don't read other languages. I don't, we can be on the same page and not be reading the same thing. I could read something and get something totally different out of it than you do. We can read a passage in the Bible, and God would give us an understanding that we'd never seen before. And maybe you heard other people preach it totally differently, but God gives you an understanding of it. You see, being on the same page doesn't necessarily, we see everything exactly alike. Pat's going to come out with some ideas that the rest of us are going to go, There's a commercial out there today. That I don't I can't remember what it is, and and uh, <laughs> Sarah might remember. It's for some sort of a phone service or something. And and these two girls are asking this guy a question, and he's like, "No, that's not the way." And all of a sudden, there's this guy standing right there by him, going uh, something about he asked him something, and out of nowhere comes this guy raising up over the over an aisle, and he goes, "Bamboozling." I don't know why. Every time I see that, I think, "Pat, what are you doing there? Bamboozling?" <laughs> The other guy goes, he goes, what does that mean? He says, malarkey? Oh, no, there's none of that. Good. And the guy disappears. Oh, yeah. Just reminds me of Pat. I don't know why. Bamboozling, just a great word, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, the idea behind what we're reading today is that we're trying to do something together for the gospel. What does it say? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. We have to be like-minded to do that. We can't be thinking, well, you know, uh, I am a deep-sea fisher. I can't get involved in these outreaches and VBS. That's beyond me. Uh, or you'd be like Jason over and catch 100-pound catfish, you know, sticks his arm up in a hole and pulls them out or something, you know, whatever he does. You know, I can't remember what they call that, but noodling, yeah. If anybody around here would be noodling... It would be Jason. Anyway, we, uh, you know, the idea is I don't care how you're fishing. If we're on the same page, we're fishing. Whether you're involved in the big catch and the drafts and the, and the nets or whether you're involved in one-on-one or whatever, we're striving together, not striving against each other for the faith of the gospel. And so what does that mean to us? It means that we are working together to try to accomplish God's will and we don't fight against each other while we're doing it. We strive together. Amen? We work together. We don't work against each other. And sometimes, and let me say this, if you're a guest with us today, you may think, whew, boy, they must be having trouble in this church. Him be teaching something like that, they must be fighting and carrying on all the time. Truth is, that's not. To, I couldn't even teach this if we were. 
If there was a lot, of, a lot of dissension and a lot of bickering, a lot of backbiting and fighting and carrying on, you couldn't even speak on something like this because somebody would be saying, oh, he's talking about me. Or even more so, he's talking about them. No, but you preach on things like this so it doesn't get started. It doesn't happen. You can stop it when it even starts. So when you start having the wrong attitude and the wrong heart and the wrong mind, there you go. I'm watching you guys. You know, I gave a women's announcement today for women's ministry, and I didn't even have to wear a wig. That's what I want to say. Hallelujah. (laughs) So there. I'm telling you. We was on the same page. We wasn't reading the same script. Hallelujah. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. We can have different opinions. We can have different ideas. One reason God establishes leadership in a church is so that if there is discussion, somebody has to make a decision sooner or later, and you go with an idea, and the rest of us go, okay, that's the way it is. This is what we're doing. And we're on the same page to strive together. Philippians 2.2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. We need to be in one accord, of one mind. On the day of Pentecost, they were in accord. Amen? On the day of Pentecost, they were together. They were in accords, what it says. They were, they were in harmony together. God poured out his spirit. That's what we want. Amen? When John and Peter were threatened and they came back to the place, it says they lifted up their voice in one accord. And there's a big, long prayer there, and at the end of that, God shook the place, and like an earthquake hit that place, and the whole place shook. Our being in one accord causes things to happen from the heavens. The power of the Holy Spirit is released. I think that's part of what's been going on here. We're kind of in accord. Now, I've noticed that, I don't know if you noticed, but Dean brought attention to it. The attendance is kind of slacked. I don't know that we've lost a lot of people. There may be a few that we have. But for the most part, everybody's still coming. Just not coming all the same Sundays. I don't know what that's about. I'm not really, you know, upset. But at the same time, you know, I'm checking. I'm, you know, you check. You know, you got a fever. You check your temperature. You got something going on. You want to check the temperature. But the fact is, we're having God move in this place because I think we've been thinking alike. The second thing that we need to do is let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Verse number 3 in chapter 2, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Two different thoughts there. Selfish ambition and conceit are not necessarily the same. Selfish ambition is someone who, who's looking for honor and position, looking for power, looking he wants to be the leader and won't be a follower and all this kind of thing. He's got selfish reasons. They've got an agenda. They've got the reason that they're even doing this is because They've got their own thing they're trying to push through or do. A person of conceit is someone who thinks they know everything. They, they're conceited in their abilities and their gifts, and, and it may not be that they're trying to push anything through, but they ain't going to listen to what anybody else has to say because they know it all. I know you all thought I was talking about myself, but that's not true, and I know it. It's having your own way or thinking you're the only one who knows anything about it. And if we allow those things to happen, then we derail the whole thing. Why? Because people recognize that. I think people recognize somebody who has, uh, who has selfish ambition. Uh, in some circles, that works. In the corporate world, a selfish person, a selfish ambitious person is rewarded. And he's moved up because, hey, this guy's going to work. He's going to do anything he can to make this company a buck. Well, We can't be that way in a church. It's not what it's about, amen? We're to be like-minded. We're to have love, it says. We're to flow, be having the same love. The same love as who? The same love as Jesus. You know, Jesus told the line, and the guys followed, amen? Jesus said this is the way it is, and that's the way it was, but at the same time, he loved them through every bit of stupidity that they had. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we got to love stupid. I've heard a lot of people say you can't fix stupid. Well, I think you can Hallelujah. If we become, if we have the mind of Christ, if we develop the mind of Christ, stupid can get fixed. There's hope for us all. Don't look at anybody. Hallelujah. You know, in chapter 2, in uh, verses 14 and 15, it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You and I, if we can maintain the right attitudes, we shine like lights. 
If we don't, we mess up. I heard a lady say one time, and it really spoke to me. She was a student at the Bible school I went to, and she said that the Lord has shown her this. You know, in the corporate world, you climb the ladder, amen? And the goal is, is to get above the guy who's ahead of you. So you climb over him. You do what you can to get past him. She said what we're supposed to be doing is helping that person up. And if you help that person up, you make a spot for you that's higher than where you're at. We're supposed to bless and benefit people. We're supposed to be a help and a blessing. We're not supposed to have agendas and have our own ambition and things like that. The third thing is let each of you look out for others' interests. Verse number four, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And in chapter two, verse four, it said, that's where it says it at, you and I, have to consider the fact that, well, it isn't all about me. Every once in a while, somebody needs to shine. They need to have recognition. They need to have, have a pat on the back, and it doesn't always have to be the same people. If you always have to be the one that gets the recognition and the pat on the back, then you need to check yourself. What is it that's driving you? Is it the mission? Is it the gospel? Are you striving together for this? Or are you striving together because you want accolades? You want hand claps? You want all those kind of things. I think at the end when we all come down and the big party is going on in heaven and rewards are given out and everything, I think that's going to be great. Amen? I mean, it's going to be better than winning an Oscar. Hallelujah. It's going to be something. It's going to be big time. But while we're here, we're supposed to strive together. We're supposed to be in humility. We're supposed to seek other people's interests and see what they need to have and what they need in their lives and what they have, have a need of. And, uh, you know, we were talking in our mentoring group about, about putting uh, people just into a position because they're available. How many know what we're talking about? Some of you have served in some of those positions before. You were available, and we needed someone. We put you in there. Hallelujah. Uh, the best thing to do is get the people where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to do. And sometimes in order for me to do that or for somebody else to do that, we've got to let go of something. I mean, you know, a pastor can't do it all. I kind of like these Sunday mornings we've been having because I haven't been doing anything. Hallelujah. I've just been standing around looking good. And that's not hard for me. But, uh, yeah, that was a joke. Now, I'm trying not to do it being conceited. Isn't that right, DJ? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, it doesn't say here, let everything that, that's yours slide while you look out after the interests of others. Let all your stuff fall apart while you help other people. That's not what it says. It says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In other words, you've got to take care of your own business, but being a help and being a blessing is what it's about. We work together. We're doing this together. Amen? Hey, while that big fish is on that line doesn't mean you can't give a, you know, throw some chum to the people that are, are catching with the big net. Esteeming others higher than yourselves. And the last thought is this, and it's the only way all this works, and it's verse number five, which we haven't read at all. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind is that? This mind, like-mindedness, to love, have a mind of love, to have a, a mind of, of being in one accord. You know, Christ and he goes on to say, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He gave up everything to fulfill a mission. We've got to be willing to give things up when it's time or when God wants us to do the right thing or when there's something that he's trying to accomplish. We have to make those decisions. We have to look at things and say, oh, have I been selfish about this? Oh. Am I working towards the right things for God? Is my conduct worthy of the gospel? Do you throw a fit every time somebody comes along and does your job? You know what I do? I go, thank God somebody else did that. It's a different mindset, but it means that they're, they're, getting, they're getting the blessing of not only learning how to do it and do it, but they're giving me the blessing of not having to. Hallelujah. You know, less is more. The less I do, the more others are doing. That's the way it goes. Hallelujah. He gave of himself. You know, in chapter 4, verse number 2, uh, the apostle's writing there, and he says, I implore Euodia, and I implore Synthache, 
to be of the same mind in the Lord. It's in the Lord, amen? Not that they just agree to each other, that they understand there's a deeper thing that has to happen. We've got to have the mind of Christ. We're working for a common goal, and we're working for the faith of the gospel. We're striving together, not against each other. Just reading that tells me that Euodia, which how come I've never heard any of you name your kids Euodia? Or Syntyche, which I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. We could just call her Sin, child of sin. Yeah, we've heard of her. But they said they had something that wasn't working right there, amen? Something in their ministry and their relationship was out of whack. But God wants to bring harmony in our relationships. He wants us to be like-minded. How can two stand together or how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amos 3.3. 3. If we aren't on the same page and agree about the main things and the core, that's why we have membership classes so people will understand what it is we believe and whether they believe what we believe. And then we have a common uh, commonality in not only our beliefs, but also in the vision that we have. There's another thing we talk about in the membership classes, things that we want to accomplish and planting churches and doing different things. Hallelujah. I was at the Indiana District Council here a few weeks ago, and uh, they were having a great debate about this subject, you know, and about different things. And and usually we don't have a lot of excitement in Indiana because we are so like-minded. It's almost like, wow, I'm serious. You go to these things, and it's like, okay, well, we're just going to ratify this guy. It's like, kind of like our, our, our business meetings. We ratify somebody, and we go home. It's a great time of fellowship, and you get to worship, and so you usually have a good speaker. But this time there was a couple of changes they wanted to make in the Constitution, and, and there was a little discussion about it. And this one guy got up, and he said, yeah, well, you know, uh, throughout the United States, Indiana's not really been known for a whole lot of anything, and it'd be time for us to step forward and do blah, 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 blah. And what he was talking about, like 28 other s- districts or 18 other districts already had it, so we wouldn't be on the cutting edge of nothing with it. Uh, after it was all said and done, and er- all the business was concluded and all the last vote, as we're getting ready to close, our superintendent said, I want to take exception with what this young man said. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, he kind of let him know he wasn't like-minded. Uh, sometimes, I guess, the chair has to rule and you have to say, hey, this this isn't right. Sometimes we have to call sin, sin, and sometimes we have to deal with things. Indiana has been on the forefront of a lot of stuff, the ministry groups, the pastors getting together. Uh, you know, I'm a ministry presbyter over one of the groups. We get together once a month, but it's, it's been broken down. It's not just a hierarchical thing, and uh, it's been some good things, and they've got that in all the states now. Well, not all of them, but uh, the ones that would give up their control and the people who would give up their control over their little areas anyway. Uh, so we've got some good things going on in the state of Indiana. We've got some good things going on here, amen? we got handbags for hope coming up. Great opportunity to throw out the net. You know, you throw out the net, the Bible says when, you, when it's been brought in, there's all kinds of stuff in there, and some of it you can eat and some of it you can't, you know. You, you, but that's the point is we're catching. Uh, we got... Vacation Bible School, and whatever that was she said we were doing or not doing, that the women was going to start doing. I don't want to know. I don't know anything about it. But uh, we're getting ready to launch the net out. How many know that to get pull off those kind of things, we got to work together? Amen? There's a dessert table hostess in here. I know it. There's got to be. All the sweet women we got in here, there's got to be one. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for the deeper work that you're doing in the river that is flowing in this, in this church. I pray that we would all allow that river to wash us clean, to carry us where we need to go, and that we would go as deep as you'd want us to. Lord, that we wouldn't just stand and look off the bank or just get in tippy toes. But I thank you, Lord, that you have something for every one of us. And I thank you, Lord, that we can be like-minded, that we can be on the same page, that we can do the work of the gospel together to accomplish your will. Uh, we don't have to have our own way. We don't have to be conceited and think we're the only ones or uh, have some agenda about gaining some position or something. Lord, let us see that what the, what the gospel requires is just a people of a pure heart and mind who want to work for you. And I thank you for that. And we lift up Brother Kevin. Uh, Lord, we understand he's had a massive stroke, and you know what's going on with him, and I'm sure there's many prayers that have been going forth, but we lift him up as a former pastor, even in this building. 
And we pray, Father, for him that he would be completely and totally healed, that it would be a miracle from God. We speak forth healing right now to every bit of his uh, functions that have been damaged through the stroke, uh, everything in his brain, Father, that has malfunctioned. We pray, Father, that you would rewire it. There's plenty of things up there to work with. You can cause things to begin to happen, work, and can circuit around all the damaged areas, or you can just heal those areas miraculously. However you choose to do it, we thank you today, and we thank you that it is a done work. It's finished. We thank you that he is healed according to the word of God, and we speak it forth and thank you for it. We pray for Josh's eye, that you would heal him, Father. We pray that whatever's going on with his eye, that he would he would uh, have complete and total, Father, uh, uh, healing from it. Uh, we thank you that the medication, the reaction that he's had, that he'd be healed from it, and also uh, the reason that needed medication in the first place. We thank you for healing, and we release that to him in the name of Jesus. And we lift up, Lord, um, Aaron and them as they go to Virginia. We pray, Father, for their travels, that you be with them, go before them, allow them to have the words to say to all these sick relatives that will cause them to walk in health and in life. And we pray that they all be ready, Father, for the... Uh, for their eventual departure. We just pray that it's not soon and that they, Father, uh, have Jesus in their hearts. We just give you the praise for it. We ask, Father, to be with uh, Sarah's friend who's being deployed. We just thank you for protection in the name of Jesus that you'd watch out over them. Lord, that they'd have no trouble, no problems of any kind going there or back. Uh, Lord, that they'd be able to deal with any experiences that they have there, process it properly in a way that they're not damaged in any way. And we thank you, Father, for your blessings to them, and we thank you that they are serving us and our country, and we thank you for all of our servicemen represented here today, all those people who have done a work to protect us. We thank you, Lord, for being with them, being with all of our armed forces today, Lord, throughout the world, and we ask, Father, that you be with all of our, our people who are working in, in other areas that bring us uh, safety and security against terrorism and other things. We just thank you that we are a blessed people living in a blessed country. I pray, Father, that our country would become like-minded. Lord, I know, Lord, that uh, the light has to shine sometimes in darkness, and I know that darkness seems to be abounding, but the more that the darkness grows, the more our lights can shine, and the brighter our light is. No longer dusk can be day and night, or darkness all the way. We thank you that our lights will shine, and we praise you for it. We ask, Father, for your blessings to every person in here. Let them go fishing this week. Father, let them fish, Father, together. Let them fish separately. Let them catch big fish, little fish, small fish, large fish, blue fish, all those fish. Hallelujah. Dr. Seuss prayers. Hallelujah. Lord, help us in the name of Jesus. Help me, Lord. Amen. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.